Welcome everybody to the GLOBE, one of the GLOBE professional development webinars for GLOBE teachers. This one is on claims, writing conclusions using the claims, evidence, and reasoning framework. Just some webinar logistics. The call-in information is here. If you need assistance, please just type a message in the chat window. And we are going to ask some intro questions in a few minutes. Raise your hand if you have any technology problems. And you can also type questions or comments as we go along in the lower left-hand corner. If you have questions for our presenter, then I will try and make a judgment whether we need to interrupt her right away or if those can wait until the end. Just to show you where we are in this series, first of all, this is the series of webinars is in support of the U.S. GLOBE Regional Science Fairs and also the GLOBE International Virtual Science Fair. The timeline for these webinars is listed here. We have archived many of them already. I'll be working on the analyzing data one that took place on January 7th, later this week. And I'll get it up probably at the same time as I get this one up on the claims evidence reasoning framework. There's also a slash here where it says teacher webinar blog. So far we haven't had any teachers offer to write a blog on these different pieces, but there is funding available and we would love to hear how this is going in your classroom. Challenges, successes, and things you may have done differently from what we had before, so or at least what was presented. So if you have anybody in your community who has, for instance, had a lesson on writing research questions and may have some insight for other teachers, then please contact me. My name is Jennifer Borjo, and I am the United States Country Coordinator. I am the lead PI on this grant for the U.S. Regional Science Fairs. I'm also in New Hampshire, and I am the New Hampshire coordinator for GLOBE. As I said, uh, we have these professional development webinars and the blogs. Along with that, we've been highlighting the rubrics for the science fairs. We have also been providing or linking to different resources that may be helpful for you as we go along. The United States Regional Science Fairs are funded by a grant from the National Science Foundation, and they are taking place in six different places. The first one is March 10th and 11th, and that's for the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic, and that's going to be at NASA Goddard. Entries for the International Virtual Science Fair are due on March 11th, and we hope that your students submit to both the International Virtual Science Fair and attend their regional science fair. GLOBE partners are eligible to fund teachers and students in their region to go to the science fair. So this is a great opportunity to bring your students to show what they're doing with GLOBE. On April 29th and 30th, We've settled on that date. It's been up in the air for a little bit, but now we are having that science fair for the Pacific region in the Jet Propulsion Lab. May 5th and 6th is the Southeast Science Fair at Mississippi College. The 13th and 14th of May is the Midwest one at the University of Toledo. May 20th and 21st is a busy weekend. We have the World Forestry Center in Portland, Oregon, which is hosting the Northwest Science Fair and the University of Texas Satellite Campus in Houston is hosting the Southwest one. And if you don't know exactly where you fall on that geographic area, you can take a look at this map. And then just to see who we have on the line, 
I have a couple questions so that our presenter gets to know you. So if everyone could answer this question, what is your role in GLOBE? I would love to know, and our presenter, I'm sure, would love to know Absolutely. who you are and what you do. All right, great. So we have a number of educators on the line. So that is great to see. And the next question is, what grade band do you teach or interact with? And you can definitely mark more than one. So mostly 9 through 12. And are you currently using GLOBE in your classroom? And most people are, yes. And I have one final question. What investigation spheres do you use? So what are your current interests? We have a nice balance. So I'm briefly just going to go through where we've been and orient you to where we're going. So the first webinar that we did was on field investigations. And it was Pat Otto, and she has a great guide through the Pacific Education Institute. And she went through a lot of the, it was a general overview of all the steps of carrying out field investigations, which is really where GLOBE is, is these going outside and collecting environmental data. And she defined these three types of questions, descriptive, comparative, and correlative. And her webinar is posted online, and it is really a great overview of how you can do field investigations with your students. And then we had Kevin Schakowsky who did developing a doable question and just talking about the different kinds of questions that students can choose and what those may look like. And then the next webinar that we did was one on downloading GLOBE data and how to analyze it. And that was both Roller from the community support team of GLOBE did that one. And also Jackie Wilson from the Hubbard Brook Research Institute did that. And she used as the basis this graph choice chart, which is a fantastic resource. So that one, again, that webinar I'll be posting very soon this week. And you'll be able to view that. And then I would like to introduce our presenter who is Rebecca, and I, I want to make sure I see, Kat Singer. Kat Singer, right? yes. Yeah. And she is from Boston College. She's a PhD candidate. And I am just thrilled to have her present for us because she has been working with Kate McNeil. And Kate's uh, resources are ones that I've used many times with teachers. And this whole presentation on writing conclusions using the CER framework is just a great way to help students and to provide this scaffold for them to discuss their data. And I'm not going to say any more than that because she has a fantastic presentation for you and I do not want to take any more time, but I am just over the moon so happy that she could present for us. So I will let you take it from there. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. I didn't know very much about the GLOBE program until a few months ago, and I'm really thrilled to be able uh, to work with all of you. Um, like Jen said, 
I'm a PhD candidate at Boston College, and I do research around different science practices. Um, but my probably more, even more important role is that before I started the PhD program, I taught middle school and high school science for 10 years, um, both in private schools and in the Denver public schools, actually. Um, and so I come to you both with the research, but also with the practical knowledge of what it takes in classrooms and the, the complications that can arise. So I hope that what I share with you today can really um, help you in supporting your students um, in writing conclusions. So I'm going to share with you, I'm going to share PowerPoint with you, and then during the presentation, there's a few different places where I want to get some feedback or ask some questions. So I'll switch back um, to this um, application here. So right now, you should be able to see my PowerPoint. Jen, can you confirm that you can see it? Yes, we can see yeah. it. Yes. OK. So it looks. All right, so today's um, presentation, Writing Conclusions Using the CER Framework. Um, in terms of an agenda for the next 40, 35 minutes or so, I'll definitely leave some time at the end for questions. Um, taking a look first at the GLOBE rubric and thinking about what makes a good conclusion. I'll then talk about the CER Framework specifically. We can take a look at some student writing of uh, students who've used the CER Framework and then talk about what are some common challenges students have? And then, of course, how can we address those challenges? And finally, to broaden this just a little bit, if we think about CER, claim evidence reasoning, in terms of a scientific argument, what are the applications of this beyond simply writing conclusions for the science fair? And then we'll end with some questions. So what you see now, I just pulled levels three and four of the uh, rubric for writing a conclusion um, at grades three through five, six through eight, and nine through 12. And really what's threaded through all of this um, is the idea that student conclusions need to be supported by data and that students need to explain how and why that data supports their conclusion. And that's consistent across the grade levels. So what we're really talking about here, if we are thinking about what makes a strong conclusion, is first that students are using relevant and sufficient evidence in their conclusion so that the evidence actually supports their conclusion, it's related to it, it doesn't contradict it, and that they have enough evidence to be persuasive in their conclusion. And then the second component being that they should be able to in some way show why the evidence supports the conclusion. So they need to link that evidence to their, uh, what they're claiming happened um, in their investigation. So the first poll I have for you, and I'll switch back in a minute, is if you think about the students that you work with, what do you think is going to be the most challenging aspect um, of writing a conclusion? So I'm going to switch back um, and pull up the slide. There we go. So if you think about writing uh, students in, who you work with writing conclusion, what do you think would be the most challenging aspect? Great. So starting to see emphasis on using relevant evidence and then um, definitely linking that evidence to what students are conclusion, concluding. Um, all right, great. Um, so I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint now. Great. So of course, there's no right or wrong answer to this. Um, and it's certainly possible for your students to be challenged by more than one aspect. But the good news is, no matter what is challenging for your students, um, research has shown that this claim evidence reasoning framework is a really great scaffold, a really great way to support students in writing conclusions. It forces them, it supports them to include both sufficient and relevant evidence, and then to use science ideas, to use the content that they're learning to show why the evidence supports the claim. So I'm going to just very briefly talk about the components here of the CER framework. So a claim is the answer to the scientific question. Whatever this doable question is that they came up with to investigate, they now need to provide an answer to it. Their evidence is their data. Their measurements are observations that support their claim. 
So they may be pulling from multiple sources of data, or they may have one source of data. They may have uh, observations and just qualitative data, or their data sets may include both quantitative and qualitative data. But whatever that data is that's relevant and supports the claim, we want them to include it. And then one of the most challenging aspects I found both in, for me to make sense out of this and for students is reasoning. And the reasoning is where the students show the link between the data and the claim, often using a key science idea. Um, sometimes people put another R at the end, so C-E-R-R, -R, um, and that's a rebuttal. Um, it includes uh, why another claim actually is not um, accurate. And if we think about conclusions as trying to be persuasive, you're trying to persuade an audience that your conclusion is accurate, that your data and your reasoning really do support your claim, then a rebuttal can make it that much more persuasive because it's going to tell, say, well, you know, you might think it's this claim, but it's actually not because of this reasoning or this evidence. So as students become more proficient at CER, we like to add in a rebuttal, especially for the older students, again, to make their conclusion more persuasive. Um, this is another way of thinking about it. If students have gathered lots of different evidence, then um, as they employ reasoning, they're going to try to convince you that their claim is accurate. The rebuttal here, again, is why it's not another claim. And you're going to use it's not this evidence or it's not this reasoning. Um, and in that way, make this initial conclusion that much stronger. So I have some examples now um, from different content areas um, of what a CER would look like. So if, you're quite, if you were investigating pulley systems and students did an invest, or a series of investigations to use pulley systems and try to figure out which system required the least force, they might write this conclusion. They might say that a pulley system with two movable pulleys and one fixed pulley required the least amount of force. So that's their claim. It's a one sentence answer to their scientific question. Then they're going to use their evidence. Um, this student talks about um, how the system that had the two movable pulleys and the fixed pulley took an average of 0.82 newtons. They tried three other systems, but the closest was 0.23 newtons more because it required 1.05 newtons. So um, they certainly could have included a little more evidence, but they summarized their evidence nicely. It certainly is relevant to this claim because it shows that the two movable pulleys and the one fixed pulley system took the least amount of force. And then the reasoning here tries to explain, well, why having the least amount of newtons meant that this pulley was able to use, um, this was the pulley with the least amount of force. And it um, talks about what counts as a fixed pulley and why fixed pulleys work the way they do and that they just change the direction and how those are different than movable pulleys, which reduce the amount of force. So therefore, and this is the link here between um, the evidence and the claim, using one fixed let us have two movable, which decrease the force more than having one movable pulley. So claim evidence reasoning um, to convince you that this is the pulley system that requires the least force. Here's an earth science example. Um, if students are investigating sun shadows, the question is how can sun shadows be used to tell time? So um, the student's claim is that the length of the sun shadow can be used. And then students provide some evidence from their observations and measurements outside over one day, could, or it could be over a month, um, that they're collecting this data. Um, and then in their reasoning here, they're going to explain how the length of the shadow relates to how high the sun is in the sky. Then they talk about the sun's position in the sky and why it's there, bringing in the Earth's rotation. Um, over a day. And so in this way, they're showing why when the sun is higher in the sky, the shadows are shorter, which they can be used to sh uh, show time. Again, claim evidence and reasoning to answer this question. Um, a life science example. In this example, um, some middle school students were given a series of food webs to take a look at. And so you're going to notice in a minute that their evidence are their observations of the food web. And students are being asked, what would happen to the shark population? if there's a decrease in the phytoplankton population. Um, so the student's claim here is that the shark population would decrease if the phytoplankton population decreased. Then the student's evidence is from their observations of the food web. So they're discussing what various species in the food web eat. So the sharks consume other fish. Um, the ocean fish and lantern fish eat other organisms. And then the shrink and the colopods eat the phytoplankton. So they're talking you through their observations of the food web. And then down here in the reasoning, the students are bringing in a definition of what a producer is. 
And so they talk about how phytoplankton are producers and what producers do, which is make their own food from the sun. Um, and then they discuss that all the other organisms depend on the phytoplankton. Now they're going to link, they're going to provide a nice link to their evidence. If the phytoplankton die, primary consumers will die because they'll have no food, which will cause the secondary consumers to die, which will cause the shark to die. So claim evidence reasoning here again to answer this question. I want to show you what rebuttal might look like here. Um, so in the blue at the bottom it says, you might think the shark population would not change because they do not eat the phytoplankton, but actually they will die out because they eat organisms that eat organisms that eat the phytoplankton. Um, so in adding that rebuttal, the students are making their original conclusion that much more persuasive. They're saying, you know, if you have this other claim about what, what might happen, it's actually wrong because, um, and then they share some knowledge about um, why that exists. So again, claim evidence and reasoning and then the rebuttal to make it a little more um, persuasive. So if we think about writing a conclusion, what we're really talking about here is writing a scientific argument. And I wanted to bring in um, this term scientific argument specifically because as I'm sure a lot of you are starting to think about the next generation science standards, whether your state, I, I heard someone was from Vermont, so I know in Vermont that they're adopting NGSS and many other states like Massachusetts are adapting NGSS. And one of the things that's happening are these science practices, these eight science practices are becoming part of a lot of state science standards. And so CER ties into this um, practice seven in NGSS, engaging in argument from evidence. So I just pulled some of the language here from NGSS Appendix F. And what you see highlighted in red are claims, evidence, and reasoning. Across all the grade levels, what writing um, a scientific argument really entails is having students answer their scientific question by um, writing a claim and then marshalling that evidence and their reasoning to support that claim. And as students move across the grade levels, this is becoming more um, sophisticated. Um, if you look at the bottom in grades 9 through 12, the students are also being asked to provide a counter argument. It can be thought of as a rebuttal. Um, but the, these terms, claim, evidence, and reasoning are very important um, in this NGSS practice. So I want to show you an example from a middle school student. Um, and I'm going to ask you some questions about it. So um, the students in the seventh grade class were investigating the question whether the biodiversity in their schoolyard should be classified as high or low. And the students went about collecting data about the types and number of plant animal populations around their school for two months. So they came up with quite the data set um, about the various animal populations. And a student named Abigail wrote the following very short conclusion. My group documented 20 different species of animals, such as ants, squirrels, birds, butterflies, and 10 species of plants, such as ferns, grass, and moss in our schoolyard. And we counted more than two of all of these. This means there's great biodiversity. Therefore, we claim there's high biodiversity in the schoolyard. So first of all, it, she hasn't written CER. She has her evidence and reasoning here and the claim at the end, which is totally fine. Um, CER is meant to be a support for students. They don't have to write in that order. But if you look at this conclusion, I'm going to switch over to the poll in a minute. But I want to give you a second to read it over again. And then think about what do you think is one strength of Abigail's conclusion here? What's one thing that she's doing well? So I'll give you a minute to look at that. And I'm going to switch over to the poll. And you won't necessarily be able to see this paragraph. So I'm going to switch over. Here we go. So what do you think is one strength of Abigail's conclusion? All right, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint here. We've got about seven people who have um, participated. PowerPoint. All right, so you should be able to see it in a second. There we go. So um, we have a split between A, using only relevant evidence, and a couple of people about giving credit to her whole group. Um, I would think A would be one of the strengths. I totally agree that it's really great that she gives credit, credit to her whole group and something that we should um, encourage in students. But in terms of the, if we think about the global rubric in terms of 
um, what she's doing well in this conclusion. She's only using relevant evidence. All of her evidence um, relates to her claim. She didn't bring in any other information that is um, irrelevant to it. So now if we think about Abigail, same conclusion right there um, at the top, uh, haven't changed it at all. What's one piece of feedback that you think would most improve her conclusion? Do you think it would be to add a definition of biodiversity, to cite some more types of evidence, or to write her claim more clearly? So again, I'll give you a second to read it again, and then I'll go back to the poll. All right. So what is one piece of feedback that you think would most improve Abigail's conclusion? And obviously, there are a variety of things that a teacher could do to support Abigail. Um, but if you had to pick one that you think would most improve it, what would it be? All right, so we've got most people. Oh, a few people still voting. All right, so we've got a range here. Um, I don't think that there's necessarily any wrong answer here. Um, let me share back my PowerPoint with you. So obviously, um, all of those are things that she could work on um, in her um, in her um, conclusion. If I had to pick one, I would say out of definition of biodiversity, certainly there are more types of evidence, or certainly she could be far more specific about her evidence. She could provide a lot more of her data in here, even if she does want to summarize it. Um, and um, the idea of high biodiversity perhaps um, is not as clear as it should be. Um, but let me show you what happens when she adds a definition of biodiversity. So again, same thing, it's just in purple what she's added here. So she talks about her evidence about the different animal and plant species, and then she says biodiversity refers to how much variety there is in the species in an ecosystem. Since we observed a variety of plant animals, we conclude there's great biodiversity. Therefore, we claim there's high biodiversity in the schoolyard. So by adding that definition, she improves her reasoning. She's showing why the evidence supports her claim. When she didn't do this, her reasoning was really weak. She wasn't necessarily um, demonstrating why having 20 species of animals and 10 species of plants meant that there was high biodiversity, why she could claim there was high biodiversity. But by adding that definition, she really improved her reasoning there. As you probably understand, there are other ways that she could improve this conclusion, but this um, is certainly one key leverage point for her. So in thinking then about what's challenging for students, um, first thinking about evidence. Um, students are oftentimes, they just repeat that their evidence is the experiment or the data table. I've had students write a really nice claim and then they say my evidence is in my data table. And then they move on to their reasoning. And of course what we want to have students do is summarize that and pick out the key pieces of it. Perhaps provide averages if there are multiple trials or if that's appropriate or a summary of their observations. Um, and we want to get students to really delve into that and not just say my evidence is my data table or I found or uh, my data is in that chart over there. Um, sometimes students um, don't understand what counts as evidence in science, if they don't understand it count that observations are measurements is what we're counting as evidence and they bring in their own opinions or personal experiences. Um, sometimes students have difficulty using enough data. They tend to focus on one piece of data and think that that's sufficient when more data would be more persuasive. And then students, and I think I mentioned this before, sometimes struggle with different types of data. They may focus only on quantitative data because they think numbers are more important, when it really depends on what your investigation is. And qualitative data, your observations of something, can be equally as important. In terms of reasoning, um, students can really be challenged to explain why they used some data or didn't use other data um, in their evidence. Um, very challenging for students to explain that link between the claim and the evidence. Um, and to really bring it all together and say, therefore. Um, and then including a general scientific principle can be really challenging for students as well. As you saw in the example I just gave you with that student, Abigail, um, by including that definition of biodiversity, it really made her uh, conclusion that much more persuasive. But that can be something really challenging for students. So then thinking across both these challenges that students have with evidence and with reasoning, what are some um, instructional moves that can really support students as they're learning to write CER, as they're learning to write a strong conclusion for their investigation? And so the first is that they 
can be provided with examples of written arguments and asked to critique them. That can help them um, start to understand what counts as strong claims, evidence, and reasoning. So here's an example of two arguments students could critique. In the first, um, in, across, uh, students did an investigation and they got a data set from a group of scientists um, that um, talked them through um, different adaptations or different characteristics of polar bears and their environment. So in the first argument, so they were asked to write about um, a conclusion to this, why do polar bears, why are they able to survive in the Arctic? And so this first student has a really nice claim. The polar bears can live in the Arctic, they have adaptations for the environment. Their evidence are their observations of the different characteristics of the animal. Um, so the fact that polar bears have webbed paws and allow them to swim, their claws and their use, and their fur keeps them warm. And then their reasoning is that adaptations are characteristics that allow an animal to survive and getting food and staying warm are both necessary for an animal to live. So this is a conclusion, this is an argument that has a really nice claim, evidence, and reasoning. The second argument is quite weak. Uh, polar bears are able to survive in their natural environment because they like to live where it's cold. And I put a box around like to live because this really gets at one of the challenges students have, which is to write a claim that is accurate here. It is not about whether polar bears want to live there. It's about their adaptations. And then the rest of the argument is equally as weak. Um, if you're going to provide this to students, you might want to provide a, a one argument that's got strong evidence and weak reasoning, and another argument that has weak evidence and strong reasoning, so students can start to critique them and really internalize um, what counts as strong evidence and what counts as strong um, reasoning in an argument. Um, you can provide arguments to students and simply ask them to identify um, the components of a CER. Um, again, start to understand what counts as claim evidence and reasoning. So I have a very simple example here from um, an eighth grade student um, in a local school district here. Um, the students were asked to read each other's arguments about whether fat and soap are the same substance or different substances, and then circle the claim, put a box around the evidence, and underline the reasoning. Um, the student has a very, very, very short argument. Um, but their peer was able to circle their claim, which is that fat and soap are different substances. Um, there's a box around the word no evidence. The student has no evidence here. Um, and, but they did underline the last part where the student said because they have completely different results based on their properties. So the student's alluding to the idea that something about the properties of fat and soap is important here. Again, very weak reasoning here, but an example of how students can start to take a look at each other's arguments or another argument and start to see where the components are. Um, graphic organizers, other scaffolds like sentence starters can be invaluable for this as well. Um, so one graphic organizer might look like this, where students, after they've done an investigation or they have a data set, they might write different pieces of evidence in these boxes and then provide some reasoning here, either a statement that links it to the claim or um, a statement or a definition. Um, basically to show how each piece of evidence supports their claim. And usually I have students write the claim here first, and then go back and do the evidence, and then show that connection between the evidence and the claim with the reasoning. Um, this is a different example of a graphic organizer. Very simple. It just gives the students little hints here about what a claim is, what evidence is, and what reasoning is. Something I've done with students is have them do this, and then pull it all together in a written conclusion that they write out or that they type, um, and that they don't need to use the separate sections for anymore. Um, a multiple choice format where students have to select strong reasoning or strong evidence can be really great for students. Again, um, and um, provides them more examples um, of what counts. So here I have three um, examples of reasoning. Um, the first one does a really nice job of showing a link between um, the evidence, which they describe as the speed of different parachutes falling. Um, and their claim, which is that the plastic parachute was the slowest. They do a nice job of linking that. They don't bring any science concepts into this, though. The second one is all just a description, part B, of science concepts, a definition of speed, how to calculate speed, what air resistance is, what air resistance does, the fact that air has mass. But this doesn't really provide any connection to a claim, and it doesn't really get at why any of the evidence they may have provided counts for that claim. The third one, C, shows both a link in science concepts. 
it has a claim about the parachute should be 2,500 cubic centimeters and composed out of a plastic bag. It then brings in the um, science concept of what is air resistance, and then it provides a nice link. That the largest parachute hit more air as it fell, so it went slower. The plastic bag did not let much air go through the material, so it went slower. The more air resistance, the slower the parachute will fall. Again, providing this for students, and they can select or they can analyze each of these, can be really powerful in helping them to understand what they should do as they are writing conclusions. And card sort activities are great for evidence, um, where they have to decide whether certain pieces of evidence support a claim or do not. So what it looks like basically is you give them a claim, and then you give them some cards, and have them put them in piles. Is this evidence that is relevant to the claim, or is this just irrelevant information? And here's an example from a middle school classroom that did this. Um, the students were um, doing a series of investigations, and the teacher provided them with different formats of data, so some graphs, some tables, just some um, straight out um, data from the experiment, and then provide them some other things like some reasoning, um, but also irrelevant information. And they had to decide whether it was supporting evidence or irrelevant information. Um, at the beginning, some people talked about students using sufficient evidence as well as being um, a concern. And you could do a card sort. You could look at the card sort afterwards and ask students that who of this supporting evidence, do you think this is sufficient for this claim, or would we want more? Is this enough evidence to be persuasive? that uh, we have supported our claim. So thinking now beyond um, writing a CER, writing a conclusion, um, we can think about what a classroom looks like that um, supports students in argumentation. So argumentation can be a structure. So CER is a structure for writing a scientific argument. But argumentation is also a process. And it's a process in which students debate, critique, persuade, and question each other. So argumentation for a science fair might be thought about simply conclusion to an investigation, but I think we can broaden it and think about how students can engage in dialogue with each other about their conclusions. Um, this is a key activity of scientists. Scientists critique and question each other. Um, and that's how scientific knowledge develops and becomes more reliable. And there's a lot of research out there that says that students most often don't have an opportunity to do this in the classroom. And therefore, they don't really have accurate understandings of science and how scientific knowledge develops. Um, scientific knowledge is not about a single scientist sitting in a lab developing theories. It's a social experience for scientists. And we want students to engage in it um, so that they have much more sophisticated understandings of what science looks like. There's a host of other research as well about engaging in this dialogic argumentation, this process of debating and critiquing and questioning. And it shows that for students, it helps them develop far more um, deeper conceptual understandings of science topics. So they understand the content better. They, um, it tends to support different types of learners, such as English language learners, because they're having an opportunity not just to write a scientific argument, but to speak as well. Um, and there are a host of other. Uh, benefits, the chief among them being that it's incredibly motivating for students to engage in debate with each other, to be offered critique. Obviously, this is something that has to be scaffolded for students so that they understand the role of critique in science. But um, it's very powerful. So what I have for you here is a two-minute video um, of some students who are discussing whether a gene that controls cats glowing, yes, glowing cats, whether this gene is dominant, non-dominant, or incompletely dominant. So they're trying to make sense out of some data that, um, that they've seen, and they're trying to develop their claim. And they're going to do this um, in the, a particular format. So you're, what you're going to see are two circles of students. There's an inside circle where the students are doing the talking. And then you're going to see an outside uh, circle of students who are listening and taking notes on iPads. Um, they're going to switch later on. We're not going to see that. Like I said, we're just seeing two minutes. But they're going to switch. The students in the outside circle, just so you know, um, have a specific task to accomplish. Um, and so uh, what you're going to see are students talking to each other, critiquing, debating, persuading each other. So I'm going to switch over to show the video. I think it will show better um, here. But I do have it in the PowerPoint as well. Hopefully we can hear this. Yeah, it's about non-dominance. Yeah, that's totally fine. The other thing I was going to say is the next piece of evidence we might want to discuss. Remember study two about those jellyfish that had all the kids? 
I'm wondering what people thought about that. What kind of sense can you make of that? Um, I thought it might have to do with the female cats, the moms, because maybe they're carriers of the trait, but um, they, aren't, they aren't directly affected by it. So they don't glow, but they might pass that trait down to their offspring. Yeah. Well, I thought it mm -hmm. said that they breeded 400, um, oh, those are jellyfish, actually, never mind. Well, there were those jellyfish that um, didn't glow, and then they breeded like 400 offspring, but none of their offspring is glow. So that could be, um, we, that could be. Are you saying that the, the things that do have the carrier, like, produce ones that don't have a carrier? Well, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying um, that we could assume that they would Care, like pass it down, but there also might be that chance that they wouldn't. That's true. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. very unlikely that there'd be all of these generations and not one of them would glow. Like, that would happen with a yeah. jellyfish. Yeah. So it'd be like, yeah. I don't know. But I guess they're different than cats, right? Yeah. yeah, they're different than cats, but at the same time, if there's all those generations, if it's not if they, if all of those generations ha don't have it, then there's got to be something, something wrong. Yeah. 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 All right, I'm just going to switch back to the PowerPoint here. Like I said, a really, really short um, snippet from this classroom um, where the students are um, talking about um, this video. Um, about, uh, I'm sorry, they're talking about uh, these cats glowing and what they're trying to decide throughout the whole class, more than just in the two minutes, is whether this gene that, that controls the, cat the cat's glowing is dominant, non-dominant, or incompletely dominant. So if we think about what just happened though in that classroom, I think there's a couple of key takeaways. First, um, students are talking to each other. The teacher is not directing the discussion. We heard him talk at the very beginning he made a suggestion about some data they might want to look at. We didn't hear him again. Um, and this is really key in a classroom where students are engaged in argumentation because we want the discourse to be with the students. Clearly, students need to be supported in learning how to do this. But in the end, we need teachers to take a step back and to not interject themselves as much into the conversation because students, we want them to talk to each other. And as we saw, the students, when they're talking to each other, can start to clarify some of each other's misconceptions. They start to change their ideas. They start to develop a deeper understanding of what's happening and develop some consensus around the claim. Um, what we saw are students agreeing and disagreeing with each other, which is really important. Um, if students are just all nice to each other and say, yeah, I think that's great and I think I agree with you, they're not going to um, develop deeper understandings of what's happening and they're not going to move the conversation forward. And so students are using each other's ideas to improve their own understanding of the content. So they might change their mind, or they might just develop a deeper understanding um, or have an aha moment, oh, I understand now what incompletely dominant means because I heard other people talk about it. Um, and that's going to be a much deeper understanding than if the teacher had just provided these definitions or just reminded the students himself of, oh, you know, you're wrong. That's actually not what incompletely dominant means. Here's what it means. Um, so if we think then about the Globe Science Fairs, and obviously the emphasis is on writing that conclusion, um, but how can we use some of these other, um, this larger picture of argumentation with our students? So some ideas that you might want to consider are how do we provide some support to students so that they can actually ask each other questions and critique each other's science fair projects, probably not at the end, but as they're developing them, how can they offer some critique to improve each other's work? Um, and how can teachers support students in productively critiquing and using uh, that critique to improve their work? Um, some graphic organizers could be very useful for students so that they can document and assess the evidence and reasoning in each other's conclusions. So asking students to identify the claim, evidence, and reasoning, and then to provide some feedback for each other around, you know, I think that your evidence is really strong because, and I think your evidence, your reasoning could be stronger if you did this. Um, is going to help students understand CER better themselves, and it's going to help improve each other's conclusions. And then obviously, if there's opportunities in other units and other lessons for students to practice doing some of these things, it's going to be that much stronger when you ask them to do it around the science fair. So I want to bring in two additional resources um, for you for around CER. 
um, and argumentation. The first is where I got this video from, which is the argumentation, argumentationtoolkit.com. Um, it's a joint project between Lawrence Hall of Science in Berkeley, California. They develop um, a lot of curriculum, and they've recently developed some curriculum around argumentation. But this um, toolkit is um, related to the curriculum, but for use by anybody. Um, and uh, it's a joint uh, research project with Boston College. Um, and so I've worked on some of the research with that. There's some great resources on there, videos and PowerPoints to help teachers um, break down these tasks for students to help them identify common student struggles with argumentation. Um, and it covers both the structure of a claim evidence reasoning of CER, but it also gets at that classroom culture where we want students to debate um, and question and critique each other. And then the second resource is a little broader. It's sciencepracticesleadership.com. This is a uh, research project uh, I'm working on at Boston College where we want to provide resources to um, teachers and to instructional supervisors like principals or department chairs or district folks um, around supporting teachers um, in the eight NGSS science practices. So as, um, there is some work in there on argumentation, but it's a little um, broader than that. So um, we have about 10 minutes left, which is perfect for some questions. But um, before we do that, I just want to thank you. Um, you're more than welcome to contact me by email at any time. I'm great at answering email. Um, if you have any questions or um, there's anything I can do to support you or your students or the teachers um, that you work with. So I am just going to switch back here. And um, Jen, um, we're ready to open it up for some questions. OK, great. Does anybody have any questions? And I think what I'll do is I can open it up completely, or you can just raise your hand or put your question in the chat box. Either way works. Rebecca, can you go back to one of your slides, the one sure. with the graphic organizer? Yes. Let me share that. I know it's awkward to go back and forth. No, no, no. It's actually not so bad. Uh, let me just get up. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, let me go to the. It's the one. Let's see that one. This one here. Yes. Yes. So what you said was you mm -hmm. often have the students write the claim, and then mm -hmm. could you just go through the order again sure. one more time for me? Sure. So there's, I think there's really two different ways you could do this. Um, you could have students kind of take a look at they're analyzing their data. You could have them take a look at that and then write an initial claim here on what they think the answer to their question is based on that data, and then have them go back, put some different pieces of evidence here, and then put the reasoning in that would tie that evidence to the claim. Another way to do it, if students are having trouble with the analysis of data, is have them put several pieces of evidence here and have them then develop um, the claim. Um, so I think that it doesn't have to be necessarily left to right. OK. I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that there are different mm -hmm. ways to use this. Because I think that some students may be more comfortable in one way mm -hmm. versus another. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a great point. Thank you. No problem. Uh, and then we had some other questions. Are there resources online with CER questions? Could you be more specific what you mean by CER questions? So let me, uh, Megan, that was yours. I just yeah. unmuted you. Would okay. you be comfortable asking and describing? Yeah. Oh, so I've used Project Neurons um, questions on some of their projects, uh, which mm -hmm. is which are designed for CER, or I mean, conclusions um, to do CERs. But I think I need more examples of student work okay. with plain evidence reasoning. And I was wondering if there was a, a place online that I could. With student work, that's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head anything with student work. Um, I definitely have some student work I could share with you if you wanted to email me. Um, okay. I have some examples from some local students. Um, there definitely are a lot of resources online for CER, but I don't know of any off the top of my head that have actual student work, which I, is too bad because it can be very useful. Um, I will say that um, K-12 
Kate McNeil's book, um, she has a, an elementary book and a middle school book. Um, both of them focus, use the CER framework. They probably have some, in fact, I know they have some student work in there in the text. Um, but if you wanted more examples, you're more than welcome to email me and I can share some with you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Michael, would you be willing to share your PowerPoint? Absolutely. Um, Jen has a copy of it, um, which she could, I don't know if she's sending out, and I'm more than happy to send it to you as well if that would be helpful. I can post it on the page. It will be posted on the page? Yes. So the only thing okay. that won't be in there, is obviously, is the video. I couldn't send it with even the picture of the video, but um, in the PowerPoint is a link to the website. Uh, it's a link to the video. So you could take a look at that and a number of other videos. Um, and uh, Julie, is there something we could share with the Globe students? Absolutely. Um, I would hope that um, anything here that you think is useful for your students that you would share with them. I think. The more that students understand what counts as claim evidence and reasoning, the more that they are able to do it. And so if there's any slides in here or anything that's, that's useful, um, please share it. And Julie, were you referring to maybe the graphic organizers or the entire PowerPoint? Oh, I muted you. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, the graphic organizers. Sure, absolutely. So we'll make sure that we kind of pull those out. If that's okay with you, Rebecca, we'll pull those yep. graphic organizers out and yep. post them separately. Sure. Great. Are there other questions? I'll actually unmute everybody. And the conference has been unmuted. So if everybody could mute if you are not speaking, just so that we make sure we eliminate that background. And again, big fans of the graphic organizers online. Great. Great. <laughs> are there other questions? Either through the chat or by raising your hand, either way. I would love uh, more examples of sufficient evidence and um, evidence that doesn't support or doesn't help out. There was a slide where you showed like a middle school question or a middle school conclusion question and then students had to um, put evidence on both sides. That was great. Mm -hmm. So um, in that example, um, the teacher provided some science facts, like some, um, some sci like something you can include in reasoning, like um, some science knowledge that wouldn't count yeah. as scientific evidence, and so they would put that in irrelevant information. They might also provide some evidence, some pieces, some data that would not support that claim, whether it came from this investigation or from another investigation. So then students would have to figure out this is irrelevant for this argument. Um, so irrelevant, so, but not counter. Acting. Contradicting. Not a, not a, it doesn't have to be. I mean, it kind of depends on what your goal is. Um, that teacher, his goal in that classroom um, was to have students recognize what counted, first, what counted as evidence and what supported that claim. If you were trying to really just hone in on the idea of relevant evidence, you could have just two piles, one being relevant evidence, one being irrelevant evidence, and having students yeah. try to figure out whether a piece of data um, actually supports that claim or doesn't. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Uh, n not really in that uh, I would love to actually have some, like it would be great if I could actually use um, his resources or uh, there was a resource online that had some yeah. questions already. So if you available. check out that so that argumentation toolkit website definitely okay. has some resources around that. And if you don't find exactly what you're looking for there, just shoot me an email and I'm happy to find something else for you. Thank but you. But I know I know that, that picture actually comes from that website. So um I know that there's um at least one video in there about um relevant and sufficient evidence. 
And I'll just add that Kate McNeil's books, those are ones that we use quite frequently with our teachers, and those definitely have some examples mm -hmm. and go into detail. So this, if you wanted to follow up with those books, they are mm -hmm. really nicely done. They are, and they come uh, with um, a CD of videos of classrooms doing various things. So um, you can really see what it looks like in a classroom. Thank you. And Mike asked about what page we're posting the resources to. All, if you go to the United States Globe page, from there you, cannot, you can get to the U.S. Regional Science Fairs page. And that has the calendar of all these events. And then each of these events, such as a webinar, has a link to the description of the webinar, as soon as we have the video posted to YouTube, that's embedded there. And then all the resources and their links are spelled out from there. So everything will be on that page. And I'm just going to skip through the rubrics. But these are the conclusion rubrics to get to the resources. So these are the resources that will be posted on that page. And those links will be on the YouTube videos. So I've grabbed these from different pages in the, within the GLOBE website and highlighted them that have to do with conclusions. So we have the steps of the scientific process. The documenting conclusions has a particular page there in the past. In 2013 was a webinar on scientist skills presenting your results. We have the research report format and then also the webinar on rubrics and the resources for the International Virtual Science Fair. So those links will be on that page. And then if you have any resources that you want to add to that page, and then I'll also add Rebecca's resources and those links. If you have anything, there's a place for you to comment and add your own resources that you may have used in your work with students. So we definitely would love to have more resources that we can share with the community around that. And it is 401, and I like to end on time. So I'm going to thank Rebecca for presenting and for sharing her research and her work in writing conclusions using the CER framework. Thank you and for having I me. It was a pleasure. And the next one of these I've just confirmed is going to be on putting it all together and making a great poster for student research. And that's going to be by Liz Burakowski. And she is a postdoc at UCAR. And she has done some really exciting work in climate and also in albedo and some really interesting work around her love of skiing and how climate and albedo, all that plays into skiing in New England. <laughs> so, uh, but she has also done some great posters and won awards. So that is why she will be presenting to us. And that will be February 11th at 3 o'clock. And I hope to see you all back then. And with that, I'll close. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thank you.